Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Well, hi, this is Stan in Gainesville, Florida, and today we discuss conflict resolutions, shop order items, ugly surprises, the top 10 programs, and mentoring styles, all on Light Talk. And this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk and we are the Lumen Brothers, Lumen Brothers. Yeah, original, original recipe. Stan, Steve, and me. Boy, that sounds like a funny little group there, Stan, Steve, and me. It could be, it could be a Woody Allen movie. <laughs> yes, that's true. It is a Woody Allen movie. He doesn't come up with titles until they're done. Actually, I think this is more Marx Brothers than Woody Allen, but... You yeah, know. maybe so. That's true. That's closer. <laughs> well, welcome, everyone, to episode 347, and it's great to have Stan back. I'm, I'm happy to be back, because I just opened the show, like, oh, what did last you open? week. I opened a production of Cherubon, which is a beautiful sort of rom-com opera, French, of course, by Massimé. And uh, it was at the University of Southern California, where there's more money than God. And uh, (laughs) God has money? God God doesn't need no stinking money. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they have a lot of money there. And uh, and it was great. I worked with my old old friend, Ken Kazan, the director I work with all the time. He heads the uh, opera program out there. And I did the scenery, lighting, and projections for this production. And it was a big job, let me tell you. But I must, I must give a shout out right now before we go on, because we have a lot to talk about today. It's a great show. Boy, I'm so excited about what we're talking about today. It's fantastic. Stan came up with two great ideas. I want to get uh, started by just giving a shout out to two people who I could not have done this without. And one was my assistant lighting designer, Kelsey Aragi. And Kelsey, she's an undergraduate student at UCLA, and she is she knows more than most graduate students after three years of grad training. And I think that's a testament not only to her and to her, you know, her curiosity and and also her her, her just her talent, but also to LAP. Because LAP is running that program. <laughs> so LAP, you're doing a great job, man. And then at the last second, and this could have been one of our listener questions, what do you do when your programmer leaves the, the show one day before you start programming? <laughs> that happened here. And uh, she, fortunately, her partner is a programmer. So, and his name is Keegan Weber, and he came on board, and he's just, I don't know, he's like 24 or something like that, 20, I don't know, he's really young. Kelsey, I believe, is like 23 or something like that. And uh, he was fantastic. So, they saved my ass. It's that simple. These two people were so great, and I just want to give a shout out. They are longtime fans of the show, so they're probably listening today, right? So, Kelsey and Keegan, love you guys, and, uh, and if anyone needs a great programmer or a great assistant, call these people up. Uh, you can go ahead and contact me directly, and I'll give you their, their uh, contact information. So, Stan, you had some, inf- uh, some news as well, don't you? Yeah, I do. Um, actually, a, a, a nice, excellent, small program that I used to teach at in the middle of Nebraska called the University of Nebraska at Kearney theater program. I got uh, some news yesterday that the chancellor of that institution had uh, released a a budget cut document, I guess, of some kind, and that the four remaining faculty would be given notice. uh, They will not have a job in about a year and that the bachelor's program would be discontinued at the University of Nebraska Kearney. So that was kind of sad to hear. Um, I served as the technical director and occasional lighting designer there from 1992 to 1999 before I came to Florida. It was a good place for me to be. I learned how to teach there. It was a, it was a good, you know, cut my teeth on, in that place and did a lot of nice work. And I was sad to hear that. And I guess as David has predict, predicted in the past, a lot of these small programs are vulnerable out there. And, you know, I, I made a post and I said, you know, unfortunately, this is probably going to fall a lot of small programs and innovate and, and recreate yourselves uh, as fast as you can. Diversify. 
Did these professors have tenure, or it doesn't matter when they when they cancel a program, they can cancel. Right, it's, it, it would not tenure. it would not protect them right. in a case like that when a program mm-hmm. is. Uh, I know that the the a friend of mine, I had hired a guy, or I helped hire a guy there who who came in as their sound guy, but he's now working at the local road local sort of roadhouse that I helped that my company helped uh, design. He's got a job, but his wife runs like the box office in front of house, and so she's. I tried to call him last night, and she, he said she was kind of, uh, how did he put it, distraught. And I don't know about the other two people, so the other three people. It was a it was a pretty thriving program. At one time, it was a speech and theater department. There was a music department there. There's an art department, and I guess uh, they just didn't, for whatever reasons, uh, it was it, it's a sad commentary. Yeah, yeah, it is. Steve, do you have any news today? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I was all joyous, just, uh, and then Stan was like, "Oh man, it's people losing their jobs," which is true. Unfortunately, it's true. So, what do you have, Steve? Lift us up. Well, well, okay. So, I was getting my car serviced, and it was seven thirty <laughs> in the morning, and I'm standing there at the Kia dealership waiting for my wife to pick me up, and a car pulls up, and it's not my wife, and this guy jumps out, and he goes, "You're the coolest person." I have ever met. It's seven thirty in the morning, and you're drinking a beer. <laughs> now, wh- what I had was a uh, uh, no caffeine Coca Cola in my hand, but I didn't want to destroy the illusion. He thought I had a Miller Light in my can in my hand at uh, seven thirty in the morning. Then just drove away, you know, just happy as can be. Probably going to go find a beer for himself. All right. That's awesome. Steve, That's all I, I have. That's it. Well, no, you have something else because, because we are preparing. As we all know, next week we're going to be at LDI doing our live show. And I'm going to be there. I'm and and be there. Stan will be there and everybody's going to be there. All the Lumen Brothers and Sisters, last I heard. Um, and uh, we have a special show for you all. It's Again, it's Sunday at 4 o'clock. I don't know what room it's in, but it's somewhere in that new it convention center. be big center. enough. It's, it's the one that's labeled uh, a fun room. Fun room. <laughs> with, with, it's where the kids are <laughs> with the big balls. Anyway, uh, the... Uh, hey, and, my, and Pam is coming, too. Pam's coming. Wow, she this is. is awesome. Snoot will be there. Ellen will be popping in. Uh, you know, we have... Zach's going to be there. Anne, I believe, is going to be there. Uh, Brackley will be there. And we have a special presentation and surprise for you. Steve, do you want to you wanna do a little tease? I, I just want to say that I'm not sure what's in Bobby's pocket. It might be a flashlight or it might be something else. <laughs> well, okay, we'll find out. Whoa. Is that a flashlight or are you just happy to see me, <laughs> so Bobby? Anyway, um, yeah, so everybody come. Again, it's it's Sunday. We're all going to be there and we're going to have a lot of fun. And we're going to have swag. So if you want free stuff, come. You know, we, we have some free stuff for you. Uh, we got a, a surprise uh, gift for people, for certain people. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. 45 minutes right before happy hour. And if you want, bring your happy hour in with you and make sure you, you hand some of your happy hour to us. Up 45 front, okay? minutes prior to happy hour. Yeah, so that, mean, that means that we cannot go 46 minutes. <laughs> no, no. This show's 45 minutes long. It's done, baby. It's done. So let's get started with today's show. Steve has our first listener question. Yes, and it is from John in Ohio. And John asks, how do you handle student conflict among the cohort? Maybe it's just end of the semester stress, but I notice tension in the classroom and in the theater. How about cage fights? You know, you bring the cage down, right? And people like, you know, wrestle until like the last person standing. Cockfighting. Right, cockfighting. (laughs) Bring your own bring your own chickens. (laughs) Bring my OC. Bring your own chickens. (laughs) You said you need to post all those stickers. I have one sticker on my door that says, uh, I apologize for what I'm going to say. In tech. <laughs> in advance. <laughs> yeah, just, just post those all over the building, you know, so like everybody that. is sort of lower expectations for looking. For, if you're looking for diplomacy, don't look here. Right, right. You know. I like that. So, Steve, what's your answer, buddy? Well, I would say, John, you need to think this over a little bit before you get involved. And you need to honestly assess the situation and whether or not it really needs your Solomon-like wisdom, because it may not. Uh, 
you know, if, it, if you do need to get involved, I think you need to figure out what you're going to say before you get in the room with the uh, participants. And I think the first thing is probably, and I'm not an expert in this at all, I'm sure there are human resource videotapes to watch to get you through this. Um, I, I think the first thing is I wouldn't blame anybody. I wouldn't start the conversation by assessing blame. Um, I think what you need to do is kind of carefully listen uh, to whatever. Let's assume there's conflict, there's two sides. I think you'd listen very carefully. If you don't understand something being said to you, I think you need to ask for a little clarification. Uh, and then I think you need to say, let me sleep on this. And you set up a second meeting after you've thought about what this um, alleged conflict is. So you just don't jump into it at the first meeting. And then I think you have to work with your uh, students on kind of understanding why this has happened. Um, and then, I mean, th this is simple stuff. The, uh, you then propose some resolution to the conflict. Uh, and then I think you, you have an obligation to follow up and see how things are progressing among the students who have had this situation happen. You know, mo I have to say, again, I'm not an expert. Most of the time, student conflict resolves itself. And most of the time, and yours may be an exception, most of the time you don't have to get involved. A lot of times your door can be open and you can just be someone for someone to, uh, they want to talk. They don't want necessarily you to talk to them. They just want someone to talk to and get it out of their system and then move on. But, you know, students are pretty good about uh, working together. And I think that's part of the, I think that's why you have a cohort is a lot of different personalities into the mix and a lot of different ideas. And sometimes feelings get hurt. Uh, we know what Stan thinks. Uh, he's just going to insult them because there's a sticker on his door. No, no, I actually um, have something to add. Have you not read the sticker? Oh. <laughs> I, I what, have do you, what do you have there, Stan? I do have something sh short and simple to add. So these things can become emotional. And so if we just break down that word. So I don't know who said this. I'm, I'm somebody smarter than me. So emotion is energy in motion. And so sometimes the best thing to do is nothing. And sometimes that's the hardest thing to do. So there's a natural, I think Steve is getting at this, is a natural impulse to intervene. Um, and sometimes that impulse is not necessarily the best thing to do. So sometimes refraining or doing nothing and allowing the energy to dissipate on its own is a wise choice. I think that's actually very wise because sometimes when there are high emotions, you get caught up in it. Add to David's point about getting caught up in it is you don't take it personally because if you, somebody else's opinion is more about them than it is about you. And if you, if you agree with somebody else's opinion, that means you're taking that in. You're eating that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I'm looking down at the next questions and they're all about conflict <laughs> in one way or another. <laughs> I mean, this is going to be a very conflicting show. Uh, it's I think it's the Steve's, holidays. It's perfect timing. It's the I mean, holidays. It's, you know, we're all going to have a night. Well, you've had nice Thanksgivings by now, but yeah, we, we're going to have that. It's all terrific. But unfortunately- Uncle, Uncle Tom is coming to, to Christmas dinner. How do I talk to him about politics and religion? Yes, yeah, you, you mean, you mean the, the, uh, the, your, your Nazi Uncle Tom who now exactly. is a Trump supporter. Right. Or yes. drunk no, drunken uncle. Drunken. Well, you know, I used to have a drunken <laughs> Uncle Bert, and that was really a lot of fun. <laughs> uncle Bert, you know, he was an old Catskills comedian, and he would tell his dirty Catskills jokes on at the Passover table. Yeah, that was a big hit with my mom. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, yeah, I think what Steve said is, is correct. I mean, you just, sometimes you have to be like Solomon. You're in a, put in this position where because you're the professor and you've got two of your students who are arguing about something, you're going to be the one that has to make that decision. Or you can basically say, you guys work it out for yourselves. I don't care what it is, so just work it out and then come tell me what you decide. But if it gets to that point, you're going to have to make that decision. You just make the decision. I don't know. You know there's not a lot of time for that sort of thing. 
And and again, it's a it's a good learning learning opportunity for the students because this may happen in the profession, and they need to know how not to make enemies and how to and how to resolve issues and solve problems without being personal about it. And I think that's great. You know, we were talking about this last week about re, you know, reinstating some sort of formal uh, postmortem. Oh, we're doing, right? they're doing that at UF, but I'm not going to be part of it. And a big problem with the postmortem is that a lot of students don't know how to criticize objectively, not only objectively, but gently. And um, so we decided that what we're going to do, and thank God I won't be there for this <laughs> because it's going to start next semester and I'm gone. Uh, but, but but they decided what they're going to do is uh, to start off with just the faculty talking for like maybe 10 minutes and showing them how you, you know, gently uh, make suggestions. <laughs> now, <laughs> Steve is laughing hysterically because, and I know what you're laughing at, buddy. I know what you're laughing yeah, you at, need buddy. To, you, you, you need to bring those students to a faculty meeting. <laughs> Over exactly. over parking yeah, spots. My faculty okay, meetings. About, my faculty think, meetings are silent. They're no, silent. That's, that's, those are the best ones. Those are the best ones. Like the director oh speaks and nobody else. And, and it's like, there, there don't get go. me started. I'm going to quote John Lennon here, though. <laughs> John Lennon was great at turning a phrase. You know the old expression, T- uh, "Time heals all wounds." Well, John Lennon said, "Time wounds all heals." There you go. <laughs> okay. All right. So Stan has the next question. Jerry in Fresno wants to know, what's the most overlooked item when you put together your shop order? Funny you should ask, Jerry. <laughs> um, t- just today we were reviewing some, uh, you know, we get submittals on projects and we have a bill of, we call it, in architecture world, we call it a bill of materials. In theater world, we'll call it a shop order. It's just a list of all your stuff. And uh, we realized that maybe we didn't put, wait for it, something so obvious. We didn't put, cable. We didn't put jumper cable. We didn't put DMX cable. We didn't put Powercon cable. And we're like we're freaking out. And we're going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Because it's a bid and like the the price is the price. So what would happen now? The price would go up. But luckily, in our case, we found out that when you buy a fixture from ETC in these, or whoever our uh, systems integrator was, they included a 10-foot DMX cable with the fixture. So that was good. And then I found out that ETC, in fact, even though you get a PowerCon cable with a moving with a fixture, you can opt for instead of a PowerCon, you can get a PowerCon jumper. So we're going to be okay. But I think cable is sort of obvious, but easily missed. And so are things like tape, you know, little lights, um, you know, uh, spare connectors, spare bulbs, things like that. But uh, today, for me, it was cable. What about you guys? I would say uh, the most, a shop order. Yeah. I think the most obvious uh, thing that young designers miss, and that's why you need a crusty old master electrician working with you, young designers miss a ladder. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's just, they miss a ladder or they miss work lights. Mm, work lights. And all of a sudden, th- those are two big deals. Yeah. What about you, David? I was happy to hear you say cables because that's the first thing I thought about was K- they always forget cable. Cable is like the most forgotten element on the shop order. But yeah, I, I think um, I, I have nothing else to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> that was because I don't do shop orders anymore. <laughs> anyway, okay. So Deirdre from London asks, what do you do when you show up for your first focus call and the set has been moved downstage 18 inches? Ouch. To- <laughs> Two weeks ago, I experienced this when I showed up to the theater. The TD told me that the set designer came by and told them to move the whole set downstage. But no one told me. All the sectioning I did was useless. And now fixtures that I thought would work for specific focuses are now lighting up the masking. Time is tight. Everything is hung. And the set cannot be moved. Help. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. Has this happened to you guys? Because it's happened to me. It's happened to me. Yes. Has this happened to you, Stan? Where something like this, like a change came and you didn't know about it? Not for a while. <laughs> okay. Um, but it has happened sometime, right? Yeah, probably. It's happened to my students more recently. It happens quite yeah. a lot. When, when our, our students, yeah. tech director doesn't communicate. and the student, yeah, It has happened here at school. It hasn't happened, hasn't, hasn't happened to me very much professionally, but... Um, 
Yeah, well, if you have moving lights, it shouldn't. If you have moving lights, shouldn't be a problem. No, it is well, a problem. Because you're, yeah, you're, you're hanging your lights behind masking, yeah. and masking. You know, you're making certain angles. Yeah, it's just lower the, the pipe. Just lower the pipe. <laughs> lower the pipe. Okay. Well, you know, it's funny. I've told the story uh, on the show of when I was doing. Um, and I was, uh, it was Neil Jampolis's production and I was the assistant and, uh, we hit one city uh, cause I was remounting it. Neil wasn't there. I was remounting the show and, uh, the set designer came in and said, let's raise the portal like two feet. So of course, you know, the, the 90 lights that were on the first electric cluster all had to be focused from a focus track because the set was a full rake. Uh, there was no way you can get a ladder on it. And uh, it was insane. And I said, you do that, then our, you know, I'm going to need another five hours to focus because it takes five hours to focus these lights. And um, all of a sudden, things, things uh, did not happen. Now, there's a big difference here. That was done when I was there and I could argue the, and, you know, with the uh, production manager and say, you know, we can do this, but it's going to be five hours of, of a call. And let the production manager, you know, decide. And and of course, production manager says we don't have five hours. <laughs> and uh, and uh, all of a sudden, but this year, what 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 Deirdre is talking about is a situation where the set designer made a change, and the TD went along with that without even asking the lighting designer, knowing that it would affect the lights. They should know better. This is a, apparently, I don't know if it's professional or if I don't know if, I assume it's a professional production, uh, but apparently they should know They should know better. They, you got to call the lighting designer. You're saying that lighting designers get no respect. Well, no, I'm not saying that because where I work, I get respect. I, I'm not going to complain about that, okay? But in some places, I think this may be true, Stan, that, you know, well, the lighting designer figure it out. <laughs> they have all the technology. Don't worry about it. But it would have been so easy to pick up a phone, you know, to do a text, whatever it takes, just to tell, hey, you know, set designer, he wants to move the, the set downstage 18 inches. Is that going to be okay? But this is a reason why I either I'm there during load in or my assistant's there just in case something like this happens so that I could be notified immediately before it's a fait accompli. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, this is a real problem. And uh, there's, at this point, there's nothing you can do. At this point, there's nothing you can do. Time is tight. Everything is hung. Set cannot be moved. Help. Well, all you can do is make the best out of it. And that's starting to figure out how you can light the show with the lights that are hung in there. Because they're, they're not, they're, there's no time to rehang things. You know, in a lot of cases, like in this uh, Turandot I was just talking about, you couldn't bring in the pipes if you wanted to because there was a giant dragon on stage, right? <laughs> the pipes couldn't come in down past like 16 feet. So you can't rehang anything. And, and there's no time to do that. So you just then have to solve the problem. And when you solve a problem like that, you know, then you're all of a sudden the hero. Okay. But if you're just going to piss and moan and, and complain about it, then it's going to be a big mishigosh and everybody's going to remember of you being a big jerk. So you just have to handle it correctly. Um, but it's hard. And this does happen sometimes. So that's all I have to say. Yeah, you, you get hired for your resourcefulness too. So, and to be able to manage change and to manage unexpected, you know, occurrences. And that's part of your, that's part of your value um, as a good designer is to, is to be able to, uh-oh, this was unexpected and how you respond is where your value is and where you can show your, actually in some ways, it's an opportunity for you to show your value. Yeah, there you go. Stan, that that's, was that's a positive spin, huh? That was totally positive and really <laughs> nice. I feel so much better now. <laughs> I was you, I was quick you, thinking you know, and responding it, it, okay, emotionally. Okay, it reminds me of a little story. I had a grad student. We were working on a new play, and it was being written as we were producing it. And so the playwrights were there. The first act was sort of, you know, he had designed the show. The student we were tech, teching the first act, and they're changing the second act, and he's freaking out. And he's like, they're changing the second act. I've and he was a very methodical, precise designer type, you know, the, that kind of designer. And, and, it, and you throw it in for a loop. And I said, his name was Mike. I'll even, I'll even, if you listen to the show, I don't know. It was Mike Aschenbach, who was a grad student here, now lives in Chicago. And I said, Mike, you're a really good designer, aren't you? He goes, I think I am. And I said, so 
yeah, they're changing the second act on you. Every day it's going to be a little bit different. He's like, yeah, but I've already made my choice. I'm like, punt, man, respond. You're a very competent designer, right? React to it, respond to it. You'll be fine. And he was. You are listening to Light Talk with the Lubin Brothers, the originals. And this week's Light Talk is sponsored by Theatrical Environmental Solutions. It's the latest thing that's happening in Las Vegas. You've seen it on YouTube, and you couldn't believe it. Yes, we are talking about the famous Las Vegas sphere. Taller than the Statue of Liberty with millions of LEDs and hundreds of thousands of speakers, the audience is completely surrounded in an immersive environment of light and sound. What can be better than that? Well, you've heard it here on Light Talk a couple of weeks ago. Theatrical Environmental Solutions is now bringing the first ever personal portable rolling sphere to your living room. That's right. A sphere made just for you. A transportable sphere that completely envelops you in a warm cocoon of light, sound, and scent. Imagine seeing your favorite performing artist perform in a completely immersive environment surrounding you with incredible lighting and sound, and even the scent of their unique body odor. You will never have to pay for a concert ticket again. Although initially designed for living rooms, the geniuses at Theatrical Environmental Solutions went one step further. They created a fully transportable rolling sphere. That's right. You can either enjoy your entertainment privately in your living room or jump inside and take your personal portable rolling sphere out for a spin around the neighborhood. As it rolls along with you inside of it, the personal portable rolling sphere incorporates a unique gyroscope to keep the images constantly updated to your present point of view. As you roll along your sidewalk, you will be completely surrounded with an immersive environment of entertainment, reality, and fantasy. You can either see what is actually happening outside, or you could be walking walking down the canals of Venice, Covent Garden in London, or even a remote Martian landscape. What can be more exciting than that? Add-on options include an integrated margarita to-go machine, headset communication for production table use, and even a sexy tour guide. And speaking of sexy tour guides, make those virtual boyfriends and girlfriends come to life inside of your sphere with our special AI fantasy option. That's right. Everything is voice controlled to follow any of your prompts. Just call on your personal assistant, Sam or Serena, and they will create any wild immersive environment you desire. So be the first one on your block to roll around in your personal portable rolling sphere. And remember, the hysterical laughter from your neighbors is just a sign of their extreme jealousy. Pretty soon, everybody's going to be rolling around with you. And now, back to Light Talk. (laughs) Well, the sound of those lovable hipster monkeys trashing about Light Talk Central in Stan's backyard. Wait a second, the monkeys are back, Stan. The monkeys are back. Yes, and they are very <laughs> upset because there hasn't been sunny that much lately. So oh. they're really screaming. They want the sun back. Okay. They're climbing, up, they're climbing on my so- they're climbing up on my solar panels. They're, they're, they're slipping on banana peels on the solar panels. If you can just picture that. You know, they're, two things to solve that problem: the solar panel and the slippage. You could go down to the hardware store and get them little. Rubber boots to wear. Oh, yeah, that would be cute. Ooh, little booties. Monkey yeah. booties. Yeah, we just got some of those. <laughs> they can send you some from Louisiana. They have all sizes come up to your knees because you're always in water there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, little monkey booties. So what happened yeah, to that, the iguanas, Stan? Have, have you, no, like, the, you know, the relocated them? Mig- they migrated with the egrets. Oh, okay. okay. They hitched the ride on the back of the egrets, <laughs> and they flew south to South right. America. Anyway, it's so exciting that the monkeys are back, because I know that Steve has missed the monkeys terribly. Yeah, they're, 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 ice, they're, they're skating on the solar panels with oh, okay, their, with their okay. banana peels. They're, they're throwing feces at Stan when he leaves and goes <laughs> oh, to no. school. No, my, my, no, my monkeys are very domesticated. Oh, they don't sound yeah, we have, domesticated. We have, a, we have a Porto sand for them out in the backyard. <laughs> okay. They, they don't wear diapers? You know how you put little no, diapers we have a on portable, monkeys? we have a portable restroom. That's and, pretty and amazing. And it's unisex. Are, do they, are, are there bidets in there? Do you There's gender-neutral bathrooms we have on the property. Yeah, but are they bidets? Because a monkey needs a good bidet. Do we have, we have, what is that called? The tushy? That's the thing we all yeah, bought. Yeah, the tushy. Yeah, we have a tushy. Yeah, we have the tushy. Okay, well, they have a, a yeah, whatever. Anyway, Why are we the going sound to of those monkeys. You, you know, when it comes to humor, <laughs> when you go to bathroom humor, it means you run out of ideas. Yes, or you've said that for humor. seven years now, man. And that we still delve in bathroom humor. It's the only thing I know. What can I <laughs> tell you i've got a lot of experience in it so anyway today's let's talk about is all about 
Mentoring styles. How do you mentor your design students? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> Stan? Well, you, you know, know I, I recently, uh, for whatever reasons, I won't go into the reasons, I decided I needed to, to think about that seriously. And so I thought, well, I've never really interrogated myself on that. So I wrote it up. So in order for the lighting designer to be able to build their artistic relationship with the director or choreographer during lighting rehearsals, I refrain from intervention in their early phases and use what I call, if you'll pardon the wordplay, a light touch approach. <laughs> I watch from a couple of rows away to allow the, the development of the artistic collaboration. My goal for the students is to allow them the space to grow through relationship building making and correcting mistakes, experiential learning, experimentation, and making process. After students have demonstrated readiness in the classes on how to develop a lighting design, they are given design assignments for design implementation in the studio or stage. This takes on a new character for them, as well as pressure. They must find their own level of competency before I structure their tasks too forcefully. I too am an artist, and I must hold back my artistic instincts to the work being created to prevent any overshadowing of the student's growth and development. The student must be allowed to explore and experiment and work with the director choreographer and learn to work directly under the pressure of time. I have explained to the students that when the lighting process commences in the performance space, they must first and foremost continue to make choices then evaluate the choices collaboratively with the director choreographer, and then either accept the choice and continue, or reject the choice and make a new choice. Then continue this procedure each night that follows. One, make a choice. Two, evaluate the choice. Three, accept or reject the choice and keep moving forward. I will not offer my opinion or intervene in what I consider a sacred process between the designer and the director choreographer as they make their artistic decisions and build their unique rapport. Unless, of course, I am asked by the student or the director choreographer to do so. I am aware of the pressure of time, and I have many years of experience knowing when we are reaching a pinch point. If we are reaching a pinch point, I know when to use my judgment at the right moment to intervene and assist. If a director choreographer or student designer would like my opinion on a choice, I'll provide it. If I perceive that the student needs guidance, I will offer visual, artistic, logistical, or time-related guidance to the student. I refrain from offering student feedback in the venue. I prefer to do this in a non-public way. I offer my perceptions, coaching, and advice to the student privately. This is so that they can maintain their self-esteem, strength, and their autonomy as an artist on the team. The last thing I want to do is diminish the student's autonomy as they are learning the production in the presence of others. I provide more direct and specific mentoring after the rehearsal has ended or the next day prior to the following rehearsal. If a director choreographer is not seeing what they would like to see or are troubled by what the student may not be delivering, then I would invite the director choreographer to let me know privately, and then I will determine the best way to translate that and assist the student designer. However, the director choreographer should feel free to deliver lighting notes to the students in the typical note session as they see fit. This light touch approach that I have described above has been working for 40 years. The proof is in the pudding. Our lighting design graduates are working professionally, blah, 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 blah. I won't go into that. That's basically it. That was beautiful. I mean, <laughs> that really, that really sort of addresses everything as far as I'm concerned. I don't know how Steve feels about it, but it's, it seems, it seems like, you know, this is a, an age old problem in academic theater. And that is when people think that the actor's process, uh, the acting student process, excuse me, uh, is, uh, is sacred and, you know, you must give them time to evolve their performance. For some reason, it's not the same for student designers. And a lot of acting teachers who end up trying to be directors because this is their only opportunity to be directors, they basically are not very patient and they don't know how to handle student designers. And uh, they expect the faculty design professor 
to uh, basically step in and solve the problems. When having a student go through that process is an invaluable learning opportunity and it will save them from a lot of heartache in the profession. So it's a shame that we must justify what we do in our mentoring styles. And I'm afraid that it's not the case everywhere, Stan. And I'm not saying this is the case at University of Florida. And I'm certainly not saying it's the case at, at uh, SMU or at Cal State Long Beach. But it is the case in a lot of, a lot of educational programs where this is occurring. And I think when you said, you know, you, you understand that time is precious. Yeah, time is precious, but... <laughs> well, they're, not, under you know, pressure. they're under pressure. They're under they're pressure. Students. Exactly. So, yeah, you're there to help if, if, you, if the student asks you to help. And I always tell my students that. I said, I'm there. Because, you know, what you said, Stan, is basically how I do it. And uh, I, I think it, it is a precious and a very um, important process, a relationship between the student designer and the director, that you don't want to go in there and say, no, that cue's not working. You know, if I think that something's really terrible, not working, right, not terrible, but it's just not working, I will talk to the designer during a break or after the rehearsal or whatever, you know, or if there was, you know, they had an issue with uh, communication with the director, I try not to go and say, no, 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 this is what needs to happen. No, I don't do that. It's then a process of let's talk about this during our break. And I basically say, okay, this is how you could have handled the situation better. And maybe the next time you talk to the director, this is how you present that, right? You do it privately because you don't want to embarrass the student because that, that's not good for, any, for anybody. Steve, what do you think? So I think it comes, it comes down to what you're saying about uh, who's directing the show. If I've got an acting faculty directing the show, or if I have directing faculty directing the show, it's two very different experiences in the theater. And, you know, there's, again, no villain here. It's the actor is an actor for a reason. And they're not directing professionally. So they come into the meetings, they come into this environment. And one of the things that they are convinced of is that they have the answer to every question. And there is process is thrown out the window. It's like, take three steps and say your line, or let's just make the scene brighter. Just make, make it brighter. If it's brighter, it'll be funny. Uh, it's a shame. And this happens, you know, universities. I don't see it happening in the commercial world. Some of the worst training you get is at a university because people are just out of their element and they're trying to do the best they can, but they don't even know where to start. Well, I felt um, what I'm doing with this document now that I've had some other uh, people who are better writers than I you know, give me feedback and editorial work on it. And I shared it uh, with, uh, right now we're in a production with people who sort of know what they're doing, which is nice. But I shared it with them and I shared it with the students. And I'm going to share it. And I've shared it. I'm going to share it with everyone uh, now that I've sort of crystallized it because I never really articulated it. And I felt it was important for people to understand what they can expect from me in the process. You know, I bet you have, Stan, I bet probably at a meeting or something like that, you've said pretty much the same thing to the faculty. And unfortunately, I'm not going to say that you were defensive, but in defense of your mentoring style. And uh, they just don't want to hear it. And I think that by writing it down, it does help. And it is a document and it's a very clear statement. So I think that is going to help you, buddy. Yeah, I think I think you know I'm happy to sh if people want to uh, you know maybe maybe uh, I'll put it up on the Facebook if people sure. want if people yeah, want to yeah. read it absolutely. Uh, I mean I, I think, think it's I, great. You know I, I think, think it just it just helped me kind of you know investigate my own after 40 years. It was like okay how do I how do I really do this? <laughs> you know how do I you do know it? And, how you did it? Yeah yeah but, but I, it's good I, to I, but I never it, really yeah. thought about I never really thought I guess what was interesting here is that. I was isolated for COVID. We've had a huge turnover in faculty. So almost everyone who is either, we have people who are, know what they're doing. We have, like, to Steve's point, some of them less experienced, some of them more. But I realized none of them have seen me do it before. So there was no baton pass. So it was like the, the switch was turned off. And I'm assuming that they, that, they, that they know how I mentor, but they don't. And so I felt I needed to communicate. The same for the students, for everyone to know. Yeah. Okay, well, Steve has the last question of the day. 
Jenny in Wisconsin writes, is it worth going to graduate school if I don't get into one of the top 10 programs? Well, you know, that that's, you can take that one to the Lord in prayer. Are there 10 yeah. programs that are worthy? I don't, I don't know what that means. <laughs> and, and, and then you can, what's the measuring you, stick, you know? Right. You know, so, you know, you, uh, you know, they're the usual schools that I think probably I know one or two of them you're talking about, but it's also hard to define the top 10 schools. Uh, based on what you expect and what you want. And uh, are we talking about the top, top 10 schools if you're interested in film lighting or if you're interested in theatrical lighting or concert lighting? So it's, I think the yeah. top, yeah, I think the top 10 schools is a moving target. You know, a lot of schools have a solid training and advice to help you, I think, in your um, career. So I wouldn't be uh, too fast to discount the other programs, school number 11 through 200. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you, you, you need to take a look at what they're doing, what their alums are doing, you know, who the faculty is, geographic location. So there's a lot that goes into selecting a school. Um, I think if you don't get into whatever your top 10 schools are, I think you need to follow up um, with a brief discussion um, with those schools. So you're applying to, I don't know, University of Micronesia. You need to, you know, talk to that person and say, why didn't you take me? And I think that's a reasonable question to ask. And they're going to give you an answer. And then you're going to say, well, what could I do? How could I spend the next year or two making myself more valuable to you, making my, my uh, uh, foundational skills someone that you want in your program. So, that, I mean, that's an approach. You know, maybe you just don't have the experience that the top 10 schools are looking for. Maybe, I mean, what, whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't matter. Maybe you're not the age group they want to take into the program. Maybe they're looking for a slightly older student, and that means slightly more experienced. So there's a lot that goes into people making decisions. But if you really want to get into that school, you need to start a relationship with them. What's it going to take to get in? What do I have to do? Where are my weaknesses? Uh, and I, th I think that's uh, something to do. You know, if you got a little extra money in your pocket right now, buy yourself a ticket to LDI. Erd is going to be out there. A lot of the schools, you can meet a lot of people, show your portfolio, talk to them. You might find there's a school there that's not on your top 10 list, but is very intriguing to you. And of course, our friend of the show and Lumen brother, Brackley Frayer, is going to be there, and he's going to be hosting his annual portfolio review. So I, I think there's a lot that goes into this. I think just writing down the top 10 schools, uh, you know... I'm always amazed. Someone says, I'm going to go to XYZ school. And I always say, why are you going there? And they go, it's one of the best schools in the country. And I'm not, I'm not saying it's not. And then I say, oh, who are you going to study with? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so maybe you need to, you need to know <laughs> before you just decide that's, that's, that's the school for you. Oh, my God. <laughs> David I, knew I where that say, was going. <laughs> I got yeah, Exactly. I got to say something, Steve, uh, just to follow up on what you said about Brackley's portfolio review. People, you don't have to, like, bring, like, tubes of drawings and, you know, and a setup and a, you know, all that stuff, trip take with all your, just bring your iPad. And show them your website, you know? Just bring your iPad so you can sit down with a professional, a, a, someone who's just there to help you. They're, they're not making any money for this. Stan, have you ever made money to, to do portfolio review? No, right? I, the, no one gives me any money for anything. So you know, we do it because we love doing it. So they're going to sit down with you and they're going to look at your work and they're going to say, okay, well, what's your next step? You know, I want to go to grad school. Can you make a suggestion? Well, and they're going to do basically what Steve said. He said, why do you, you know, why do you want to go to grad school and what turns you on? I mean, are you into music? Are you into architecture? Are you into, you know, into film? Because if you're into film, you go to UCLA, right? Or you go to NYU. It's that simple, right? Or, or some other programs that probably have really good film schools as well. But, you know, you, you just have to go and reach out and get that free, free, absolutely free opportunity to talk to very, very 
respected professionals about your future. So, you know, before you think top 10 schools, oh, it's got to be Yale, got to be NYU, got to be, no, 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 no. It's the top school for you. And that may be the University of Montana at Butte. Okay. I'm just came, I just came up with that. I don't even know if there is a University of Montana at Butte. But that, that being so, that would be the top school for you if that's the right fit for you. I'm telling you now, uh, the, the iPad's a great idea, an even better idea is go ahead and take all of your photographs of your shows and build a PowerPoint. And it doesn't have to, doesn't have to look good. I have been to LDI twice now in which internet has gone down. And I've been sitting at a table with someone and they cannot show me anything because they're trying to access their website. 99.9% of the time, your website's going to be fine. The internet's going to work. But for that, that one moment, uh, your life is flashing in front of your eyes because you can't show anything. Just build yourself a nasty little PowerPoint with 15 or 20 photographs and you still have something to talk about. Okay, I'm going to invoke an old light talk term that I think Steve coined. What was it? Bupkis? Bumpkis? Yeah, Bupkis. Yeah. Bupkis. 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 Bupkis to the top 10 notion. This is not the David Letterman show with the top 10 <laughs> list. Let's just put that aside. Now, I think David was getting at it and maybe you... You might have some schools that are on your list, top 10 list, for whatever reasons. Okay, but the Met, we, we go through this here at UF, this nuttiness with U.S. News and World Report. Now we're the number five, and now we're the number eight. What's the Met? That's been debunked. The, there's, so, and I also don't believe in pedigree. Uh, I, I've been around long enough to think, oh, because you went to XYZ school, therefore, you must be extraordinary. Mm, not so much. I'm not impressed by pedigree anymore. I'm actually, look at Ron DeSantis. Didn't he go like to Yale or something like that? He did, uh, Yale and Harvard, both. I'm resting okay. my case. Uh, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to get into politics. I'm just. Say, I'm just saying that pedigree is a pedigree. I'm not interested in your pedigree. I'm interested in what have you accomplished, right? And what have you done? And what are the people that have worked with you? What conclusions have they reached about you? What were objective? So I think. That whole notion of, of putting people in a box and a rankings, um, I think Steve said it. Or you know, who do you want to? Who, whose work do you respect and think you can learn? But one, the work they've done, and can you respect the work they've done? And two, it's chemistry. You know, uh, is this somebody that I get along with? I had one student when I said, "You sure you want to come to study? You got to put up with me for three years." And the person said, <laughs> "Yeah, I could listen to you for three years." Okay, that said oh. a lot. Okay, <laughs> okay. If you could tolerate listening to me for three years and you know that already, that was okay. That's that, chem and that chemistry has worked. That student is going to graduate this year, and we have had a good time over three years. So there's a chemistry piece. Um, uh, let me quote um, David Brooks, one of my favorite columnists: "People learn from people they love. They don't learn from people they don't like. No matter how talented or ranked they might be." And I'll end it there. Well, you know what John Lennon said? John Lennon said, people who don't like you don't love you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brilliant, oh, you brought John. John Lennon back again. but um, Yeah, in a much you know, better way. In a much better way. The love way, you Lennon take is equal to the love, the love you, you make. make. Well, wait a second. Wasn't that Paul McCartney who said that? We don't know who wrote that. We got to find that out. It's okay. Lennon McCartney. All right, there you go. Ask All right, AI. well. <laughs> there you are. Well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tell us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website at lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However... If you were to choose to litigate us, the Snoop Group with the legal team of Sparks, Burnout, and Chase will defend us until our retirement funds are completely depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lewin Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, and the Republic of Texas. And be sure to join us next week when we talk about more lighting shenanigans and serve you more of our casserole of nonsense. The Light Talk Originals, broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge and humor around the world. And be sure to join us next Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. 
in the conference room at the convention center at LDI in Las Vegas. Be a part of the show. We're going to have a blast. And goodbye from Lifehawk. Hawk.